Yes. Okay, so welcome all. This is a TCS seminar at Jagiellonian University. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Peter Allen from London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Um, so Peter works in extremal combinatorics. So this is, this is sometimes Ramsey type problems, Turan type problems, often with, um, with probabilistic uh, tools. Peter in general works in um, probabilistic combinatorics, random graphs, I think some thresholds there, right? Um, today we will see a probabilistic construction of a not too dense universal graph for d degenerate graphs, if I'm correct. Peter, we are very, very glad that you joined us today and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so first off, Please stop me if you have any questions. Um, I can always cut things shorter if I don't have time to get to the end of the slides. Right, so I want to talk about universality. First, I should say this is all joint work with Yulia Bertio, who's also at LSE, and Anita Lieber now in Monash. <clears throat> um, so let me start by trying to say what the problem is. So. Let me start with the very basic thing. So I want to say, what does it mean a graph G is a subgraph of another graph H? Okay, I mean, we can map the vertices of G into the vertices of H injectively. So we're not going to have any two vertices colliding. And we insist that an edge of G goes to an edge of H, uh, but we don't insist that it goes the other way. So non-edges of G, they might go to edges of H, they might go to non-edges of H, we don't care. Okay. And for us, this script G is going to be a finite set of graphs. And this is what I'm interested in. So I have a big graph H, this I'm calling my host graph, H for host. And I'm going to say it's universal for G if it contains as a subgraph every graph in this family script G. Okay, uh, so let me give a couple of examples. So first off, if I take a complete graph on n vertices, well, this is universal for this set of graphs, the set of all graphs which have less equal to n vertices. Okay, so for this, I just take for each graph, any injective mapping at all, I always get a subgraph. Okay, uh, what about another example, something a bit more in the direction of a constraint? So the class of graphs I'm interested in is the set of trees with n vertices. And now I'm going to claim that if I have any graph H, which is universal for this set, then it has not too few edges. So at least something like n log n edges. Okay. Um, that's actually the sort of question I'm going to be interested in for most of the talk. How many edges do I need for universality? Uh, so let's see a proof of this. So to start off with, I'm just going to make an observation. For every i, I can write down a tree ti, which has n vertices, so it's in this set, and it will have i vertices of degree n minus 1 over i. Okay, so for i equals to 1, I will just write down a star with 1 centre and n minus 1 leaves, and that centre has degree n minus 1. For i equal to 2, I will take two stars joined by a single edge. And if you check, they will have to, each of these two centers has degree n over two and so forth. Okay, so I can write down a bunch of different trees with this property. And of course, if I have a graph which is supposed to be universal for this family, it has to contain all of those trees in particular. If I look at my degree sequence of H, OK, it has to contain T1. It has to have a vertex de of degree at least n minus 1. Uh, so the first term in the degree sequence has to be at least n minus 1. Looking at T2, the first two terms in the degree sequence both have to be at least n minus 1 over 2. In particular, the second term is at least n minus 1 over 2. T3 forces this and so forth. OK, and if I now add these things up and use the handshaking lemma, this graph H has to have degree at least roughly n log n. 
okay, so here I'm going to ignore the constants. I'm not really going to care about constants in front of things at all in this talk. I'm just going to observe that at this point we see any graph which is universal for the set of n vertex trees has to have a reasonable number of edges. Okay. Um, hopefully at this point, everybody is happy with what universality is. Uh, let me maybe make one comment. So there's a notion which is kind of closely related. Um, So in my terrible handwriting, this is supposed to say induced universality. Um, so if I would make this thing into a if and only, if I'd be talking about induced subgraphs, and of course you can always ask, can I have a graph H which contains all of a class of graphs as induced subgraphs? And this is more or less the same thing as asking for an implicit representation of the graph. So a labeling of the vertices of the graphs so that I can see where the two vertices are adjacent or not just by looking at their labels. This is the same thing as having an induced universal graph for a class. Okay, uh, but for this talk, I'm just talking about subgraphs. I'm not going to talk about induced universality. Okay. And I would sort of start by saying a few things which are known uh, and a few things which are sort of what we might want to look at. So for me, a couple of interesting sets of graphs are the following. So first off, I'm going to look at graphs with n vertices whose degree is at most delta. So every vertex has at most capital delta neighbors. Um, and the second set of graphs I'm going to look at, this is what I mainly care about in the talk, are these things G and D, so n vertex graphs with degeneracy at most D. And what that means is... I can put my vertices in a line and my vertices might have lots and lots of neighbors going forwards, that's allowed. But if I look at any vertex and count how many neighbors it has going back, then I should see at most capital D neighbors going backwards at every vertex. Okay, so for example, a tree is a one degenerate graph. Uh, why is that? Because I can always order my vertices by taking a tree taking a leaf of my tree, putting it at the end of the order, removing that leaf and now continuing recursively. Okay, and finally, I'll just say, for a couple of things I want to state, I want to look at the intersection of these two classes. So G, N, D, Delta are graphs which are D degenerate, but also have a bound, which we should imagine as large compared to D of Delta on the maximum degree. OK, of course, you can look at other sets which are interesting. Another set which definitely is interesting is a set of, say, n vertex planar graphs. Uh, I'm going to stay away from that in this talk. OK, so one observation I made before is if I look at this GN1, this contains all the n vertex trees. To be precise, it's the, all the n vertex forests. OK, uh, so what do we know about universality? So there are a couple of interesting questions. Uh, this audience, I think, is maybe not so much a probabilistic audience, but I still want to say a little bit about random graphs. So a nice question you can ask is, when is a random graph with n vertices and pairs being put adjacent independently with probability P universal for some given class G? Uh, this is actually easy if we're looking at the class of D degenerate graphs. Uh, why is that? Well, we sort of saw the reason already. I can draw a graph which is a star with n minus one neighbors, n minus one leaves. And if I want a universal, if I want GNP to be universal for this, P has to be almost one, okay? Because otherwise, none of my vertices will have big enough degree to be the center of the star. So this is too easy. This is a boring question. Um, actually, for the bounded degree graphs, this is quite a hard problem. We don't really know very good bounds. The best conjecture that we have is when it contains this graph, so a collection of disjoint cliques of size delta plus one covering all n vertices. So 
if this conjecture is true, then the answer is we have this universality at about this threshold. Uh, even proving that this is the correct threshold just for this one graph is actually fairly difficult. Okay, so it was done only in 2008. Um, but the best no result we know here is a long way off. So here we're looking at something like n to the minus 2 over delta as the best guess probability. And the best result we have is n to the minus 1 over delta, which is a much, much denser random graph. Um, so one thing I think I should say is why this is a difficult problem. Maybe one thing I should first say is it is easier if we look at having a graph with a few more vertices. And in this talk, I'm not really going to care about how many vertices does my host graph have. If I want to have a bit more than n vertices, I would be happy with that. And it is easier to do random graphs if you allow extra vertices. But even then, it only changes the exponent here in this main term by a small amount. We are still kind of far from knowing the truth. Um, so normally you would sort of hope that questions like this about random graphs should be fairly easy. And we would know how to prove an appearance threshold for any graph in this family. So we would know if you show me a particular graph of maximum degree delta, roughly what should P be in order for this thing to show up with high probability in the random graph. The problem that we have here is that the usual way to go on from this is to say, I want to use something called the union bound. So maybe let me quickly outline what that would look like. If I want to prove, say, that the random graph, most vertices have degree roughly n times p, the way I would do this is I would say I pick one particular vertex of my random graph, this one, and I say the chance that the neighbourhood has size roughly np goes to 1 exponentially fast than n times p. Okay, this you can do using, say, the Chernoff's inequality. And then I would say, okay, the chance that any one of my n vertices has a bad degree is going to be, at most, growing as some exponential in Pn times n, and this still goes to zero. So this is called the union bound. We're just saying add up all the bad event probabilities, and that's the worst it can be. Uh, and the reason that these universality questions are difficult in random graphs is, well, the union bound, it doesn't work. And the reason is kind of the best we can possibly hope for for these appearance probabilities looks like this. And the number of graphs in this class is huge. It's more than any polynomial. It's actually something like a factorial number. So we will not be able to just multiply this small probability by the number of graphs in this class and get anything useful out of them. Okay, so I sort of want to come back to union bounds a bit later in the talk, but for now, what I would like to say out of this is, first, this is an interesting question, which is kind of far from solved. And second, um, random graphs for both of these things don't really seem to be particularly helpful. Um, Okay, so now I want to move to what I actually want to talk about, which is I don't particularly care now about having random graphs. I just want to answer this deterministic question. So how many edges do I need for a given host graph in order that it's going to be universal for my favourite class, curly G of graphs? So let me start off with the question asked at the start of the talk. So how many edges do we need to be universal for all n vertex trees, or basically for this family? So we saw a proof 10 minutes ago that we need at least n times log n edges. And 40 years ago, Chung and Graham proved that this is actually the correct answer. There is a graph which is universal for all n vertex forests, which has roughly n times log n edges. So again, I'm ignoring the leading constants. I care about the asymptotics. Uh, this theorem is a very pretty construction. You write down an explicit graph. No randomness is, is involved at all. 
And then you write down an explicit algorithm that tells you how to embed a tree into this graph. Okay, and I'm not going to say it because it would otherwise take most of the rest of the talk to say what this graph is. Okay, so for trees, we know the answer quite accurately. Um, actually, for bounded degree graphs, we also know the answer quite accurately. And this is what it is. And this is interesting because this is actually below the conjecture where the random graph should be universal. So something you could reasonably guess is maybe a random graph is a good graph for universality. What this theorem says is it's not actually. You can definitely do better than a random graph. Uh, and Alon and Capalbo proved this by, again, writing down an explicit construction, although kind of a much more difficult explicit construction. OK. Um, more recently, uh, Conlon and Nenadov started looking at graphs with bounded degeneracy. And they could prove that if you have bounded degeneracy, but you also put, put in some large constant bound on the maximum degree, then this is roughly the number of edges you need. So they actually proved an upper bound of this form, but a lower bound also holds. OK, and maybe I want to sort of start by saying, how can one prove lower bounds, at least for these two theorems, right? For this one, we already saw a lower bound, but I want to prove a lower bound for something like this. OK, so when we are talking about trees, the way we prove a lower bound is to just write down a bound on the degree sequence by looking at specific trees. Uh, if you try this for d-degenerate graphs, this kind of argument doesn't work. It doesn't give you anything much better than this bound. Um, but something else does work. So what we're going to do is a lower bound by doing some counting. So the idea of this bound is going to be the following. I'm going to try and count how many degenerate graphs I have on n vertices. And I'm going to try and count how many of them can show up in a given graph H. And from this, deduce how big E of H has to be. OK, so the easy part is to do this counting of degenerate graphs. So I'm going to fix the order of vertices 1, 2, 3 up to n. And I'm going to ask that my graph is degenerate in that order. OK, so this is kind of easy because I can just say for each vertex running d plus 1 through n, uh, that vertex is allowed to choose a set of neighbours that come before it of size at most d. OK, so I have roughly I choose D choices for this. I'm being a little bit lazy about my bound here, but this is a valid upper bound, a valid lower bound for how many choices I have. And if I write out this product, then what I get is roughly of this form M to the power D times N. OK, here I'm ignoring already an exponential factor. Uh, it will turn out that this doesn't matter. It will in the end only affect some constants. OK, so roughly the number of ways I can draw a graph on this set, which is d-degenerate in this order, is n to the power dn. OK, on the other hand, if you show me a particular graph h, I can try and count subgraphs of this, which are d-degenerate in a particular order. OK, so how do we do this? Well, first off, we can pick the edges of our graph. So I'm going to just sort of pick this many edges of h, this is roughly the right number to be a d-degenerate graph. I'm going to sort of ignore small constants issues here, which there are some of. Um, OK, so I've picked some edges, just sort of arbitrarily in my graph H. If they turn out to span exactly n vertices, then I will just pick an order on those n vertices. OK, they might not. And in that case, I will say I failed with this choice. I will throw it away. And then I ask if this collection of dn edges with this particular order happens to be one of these things. It happens to be a d-degenerate graph with th this order of n vertices. That might happen. It might not. If not, fine, I will throw it away. 
Okay, and the reason I can afford to do this is I only want to find an upper bound on how many are in H. So the worst case is every single time I pick these edges and every single time I order them, I get one of these degenerate graphs. Okay, so how many graphs can I have picked? This is how many ways I have to pick the DN edges. This is how many ways I have to order the vertices. So my graph H contains at most this many ordered d-degenerate graphs on n vertices. Okay, and if H is going to be universal, then of course we have to have this inequality. We have to have got all of them. And if I rearrange this a little bit, then I will quickly get that E of H is at least n to the power of 2 minus 1 upon d. Okay, so when you do this rearrangement, these terms here all come from these factorial shape terms, and anything exponential just affects the constant in front of this. This is why I've been very lazy about exponential factors here. Okay, so in terms of the theorem we just saw, this one, you can prove a similar lower bound to this with the same n to the 2 minus 1 upon d also for this. So this thing is sharp. And a broadly similar, slightly more difficult argument will prove that this is also sharp. OK, um, so what I would like to argue for the rest of the talk is that, OK, this is up to log factors, actually the right answer, even for graphs with n vertices and general degeneracy. OK, so one thing I should say is actually the proof of Conlon and Nenadov that works for universality for degenerate graphs with bounded maximum degree. This does work, maybe surprisingly, just by picking a random graph of the right edge density. OK, but there's no way that that's going to work for the class we're looking at. So graphs with n vertices and degeneracy d and the reason is because these things can have very high degree vertices, right? So we can have a star with n minus one leaves in this class, for example. Okay, so I want to start by saying what the construction is that will give universality, which is going to be a randomized construction. I'm going to try and explain slowly how to prove the universality. Okay, so this is our main theorem. Um, I will try at some point to be specific about what this polylog n actually is, but for pretty much all of the talk, I'm not going to try and get into the details. Mainly what I care about is this leading term being n to the power of 2 minus 1 upon d, so the polynomial term is sharp. Okay, so first off, I'm going to just say what the construction is, because this is quite short, and I'm going to explain why it has the number of edges I claim it has. Okay, so we call this thing a random block model, and I will denote it by gamma nd. Uh, this is going to be a graph with something like, say, 300 n vertices, so a smallish multiple of n. And the way we do it is the following. So I'm going to first write out a bunch of blocks of vertices. So w1 is my smallest block of vertices. There are going to be in total log log n blocks of vertices, and this final one will be my largest block. Um, this is how I choose the size of the case block. So they're growing in some slightly strange sequence that the exponent is changing geometrically each step. And when you plug in k equal to log log n, then what we get is this final w log log n, it will have size something like 200 n. Okay, so w1 is much smaller than n vertices. It's n to the power of minus one upon d inverse. Uh, but this last block is actually fairly large. <clears throat> okay, so this is the vertex set of my random block model. This is eventually going to be the universal graph. I now want to describe the edges, and the way we do edges is as follows. So I write down 
for each pair i and j, so for each pair of blocks, or if i equals to j within a block, I'm going to write down a probability, which is given by this funny formula. Uh, I want to explain this formula in a moment. This is the term you should sort of care about. The taking a minimum with one just deals with when this formula happens to give you a number larger than one. Okay, and what I do is I will say I put edges between block wi and block wj independently with this probability, so given by this formula. Okay, if I'm looking within a block, say wi, then I will put edges within wi again independently with probability pii. <clears throat> okay, so this is what I claim will be my universal graph. Uh, first thing I want to do is explain why we get this number of edges. Okay, so I'm claiming it's just you apply Chernoff bounds. And the reason this is true is if you look at this quantity, so the size of Wi times the size of Wj times this probability Pij, uh, this is how many edges I would expect to see between the block Wi and the block Wj. And when you plug in two of these terms and compare it with this, then what's going to happen is this term will exactly cancel, this term will exactly cancel, and what you are left with is the n squared coming from two of these, minus 1 over d, there should be a minus there, sorry, uh, which is from that term, and the same polylog term from here. Okay, so between any two blocks, I have in expectation about this many edges, and I have log log squared n many pairs of blocks, and this will give me the correct number of edges in total. <coughs> okay, so this is the entire construction. Um, what I need to do for the rest of the talk is explain where this construction and these funny numbers come from and why it works. So I want to try and start by explaining where the funny numbers come from. So what we would like to do is embed our graph G. So we pick our favorite graph G in this family. And what we would like to do is say, I'm going to write down a property that this random block model is likely to have. And this property is supposed to help me embed any graph in my family. Okay, and the way we're going to do the embedding is just one vertex at a time in the degeneracy order. So at every step, I'm going to look at my next vertex of G. It has its at most D neighbors that came before it. I will need to select a common neighbor and embed it there. This is how I'm going to do the embedding. Okay, so where do these funny numbers come from? So the idea is the following. We're going to need to be quite careful when we have our D degenerate graph to look at which vertices are we going to need to put where. We're going to need to care about the degree of our vertices. <clears throat> okay, so we may have some vertices in this G, which have very high degree. And what we are going to do is we're going to put these into this first block W1. Okay, so what should the idea be here? If we look at W1, P1, comma J is actually always equal to 1. Okay, so every vertex in W1 is adjacent to everything else in the entire graph. Okay, so it's the clearly very easy for me to embed vertices into W1, even if they have high degree. Okay, so what sort of degrees are we looking at? Well, G has at most D times N edges, okay, because it's D degenerate, every new vertex adds at most D edges to my count. So 
if I look at how many vertices can have degree at least, say, this number, which I'm going to denote by delta k, then, okay, the sum of my degrees in my graph is at most 2 times capital D times n. And if I want to count how many vertices have degree at least delta k, then there will be at most this many of them. Okay, just by, again, by the handshaking lemma. And if I do this calculation, then I get at most this many vertices have degree greater than delta k plus one. Okay, and this is supposed to be a convenient number. This is the same as my size of wk. Okay, so the idea of these funny numbers wk is the following. I want to be able to say I have enough vertices in wk to embed all of my vertices of g whose degree could be in this range. Okay, and then the way we've chosen this probability is basically by saying I make this probability as large as possible without breaking this bound on the number of edges. Okay, so this is where the, the, these funny numbers come from. So the next thing I want to do is sort of explain a little bit vaguely how we might try and do the embedding. So again, I'm going to say this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to embed our favorite graph G into this random block model. We are going to embed it always in a degeneracy order. And we are going to make this extra stipulation that when I come to the, my next vertex of G to embed, I look at its degree in G, and if it's in this range, I will put it to this one of my blocks. Okay, so this is supposed somehow to deal with what happens when I have high degree vertices. I put them to a block which is sort of chosen for this. Now, let me sort of draw a couple of pictures of what might happen. So. This is my block W1, which is quite small. This is W2, and so on up to W log log n. So that these are growing quite rapidly. Um, and I have my graph G, which may be looks something like this. Okay, this is an example of a graph which has a reasonable degeneracy. In this case, it has degeneracy two. Uh, so I'm going to take my first vertex and I'm going to say, okay, this vertex has fairly low degree, so I will embed it somewhere here, for example. Okay, it has low degree, so I will probably put it in the furthest right block. And I will embed this vertex maybe also into this block. This vertex, again, it has low degree, so I'll embed it into this block, but I will have to look at the neighborhood of this first vertex I embedded, and I would have to put it to some one of these neighbors, okay? Because this edge needs to go to an edge of my random block model. Okay, and I'll keep doing this for a little bit. And there are two things that you could ask that might happen. One is, what happens if I get to this vertex, I look at the two back neighbors where, where it's been embedded to, which is these two vertices, okay? These two vertices. In order to embed this vertex, I will need to go to the common neighborhood of these. Okay, it could be in here, but in this case, since this is a high degree vertex, let me say it, maybe it has to be in this block. I'm going to look at the common neighborhood in this block. Um, and I could be worried that this common neighborhood might be empty. Now that, it turns out, doesn't happen. The way we've chosen the probabilities, any set of D vertices has lots of common neighbors in all of these blocks. Okay, so this is never a problem. We are never going to get to a place where we say, I have a vertex to embed. And there just isn't any set of common neighbors for its embedded back neighbors. Okay, what is a problem 
is the following. So maybe I successfully embed this vertex to here. But now I'm going to say, well, I need to embed all of these vertices that come after it. OK, and all of them need to go into this neighborhood of that vertex. And some things may have already gone in there. And of course, as I embed more of these vertices, I will start filling up more of this common neighborhood. So what can be a problem is I try doing this embedding and I run out of space at some point. I look at the image of my graph and it's completely filled up the common neighborhood into which I want to put my next vertex. OK, so this is the potential problem. Uh, there are sort of two extremes of this potential problem. One is something that looks like this. OK, so I have a vertex and it has some very high degree. And I look at its neighborhood and, of course, all of these vertices will have to go in there and they can start filling this neighborhood up very quickly. Uh, this problem turns out not to be an issue, and this is kind of not too hard to see if you just calculate the probabilities. The reason why it's not an issue is, why is it there are going to be so many vertices that land in this set? Well, it's precisely because this vertex has a high degree. Because this vertex has a high degree, it went to one of the early blocks, and because it went to one of the early blocks, that means that the size of common neighbourhoods or neighbourhoods of this vertex will be large in all the blocks, and in particular, big enough for all of the neighbours. OK, so this is kind of a local reason. and The way this graph is constructed, it explicitly says, wherever you embed a high degree vertex, because it will go to an early block, it will always have lots and lots of common neighbours to embed anything adjacent to it. OK, so what is really a problem or what we really at the moment don't see how to deal with is the following thing, that we have a later vertex that we need to embed somewhere. And we sort of look at the neighbourhood of this vertex and we see it turns out by luck to be have, have been maybe covered up by all of these vertices. This is what we might be concerned about. OK, so this is not so much a local reason, just we get into trouble with trying to embed this vertex because random other stuff in our graph G happened to go to the place we would like to put it. OK, so most of what I want to talk about is trying to argue why this second thing should not be a problem. So this is more difficult, and for this I need to do a certain amount of a probabilistic argument. Uh, but let me sort of first say a vague idea. So. Vague idea is if I look at one vertex of my graph G, it has a couple of back neighbors. And I look at another vertex, it has another couple of back neighbors. OK, and what I can do is I can say, well, these things were maybe embedded to this pair and this pair. And I can say, well, let me look at. the union of these two common neighbourhoods. OK, so this green blob. OK, in this picture, of course, the green blob obviously looks bigger than these four vertices. What I would like to say is suppose that I know no matter how many blobs I take, the union of their neighbourhoods is significantly bigger than the number of blobs. Uh, this sort of looks like the kind of statement you have in Hall's condition. We can sort of hope that things might work. OK, at the moment, this is just a hope. OK, but in order to get that, I want to make this formal. OK, so here is a definition. I'm going to define a collection of nice back neighbours. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to formalise what could I possibly get for blobs like this that are embedded back neighbours of some vertices. OK, so I'll say I have a set curly B of bubbles. So each bubble is one of these bubbles. OK, uh, 
a bubble should have size at most d. Okay, where this is coming from is, well, a vertex of graph G has at most D back neighbors. Okay, and this B is always supposed to be, this is the embedded back neighbors of a vertex. Okay, so this is why we get this condition. The next condition I'm going to want is this one. If I have a vertex which lives in block number K of my random of my random block model, it shouldn't be in too many bubbles. Okay, so why am I going to get this condition? Well, if I'm looking at a vertex U, okay, it came from some X in G, which is embedded to U in block WK, and X, it can have some neighbors in G that go forwards and at most D that go backwards. Okay, now what is going to form a bubble? Well, any one of these vertices is going to give me a bubble. This vertex will name X and maybe some other things as its back neighbors. And that means that U and the other embedded back neighbors of this vertex will form a bubble. Okay, now why is it that this gives us this bound? Well, the number of bubbles I have at U is at most the number of forward neighbors of X, which is at most the degree of X. Okay, and if the degree of X was bigger than this delta K, we would have embedded it not to WK, but to some W before K. Okay, so I'm embedding strategy that says this, right? Let's remember delta K is bigger than delta K minus one is forcing this condition. Okay, and the final condition is going to say, if I look at the union of all my bubbles, it doesn't cover too much of any one block. Okay, this you shouldn't be able to see at the moment. This is something our embedding strategy will have to guarantee. <clears throat> okay, so this is the definition of a nice set of back neighbors. And what this is supposed to be, as I say, covering is, Whenever I take a bunch of vertices of G, I look at their embedded back neighbors. This should always give me a nice set of back neighbors. <clears throat> okay, and I should point out, right, these things are in general multi-sets, right, because it can happen that I have two vertices of G which have the same collection of back neighbors. And the way I want to encode this is by saying, then that bubble shows up twice. Okay, so here finally is the aim I want to write. So this is my expansion condition. So if you show me a nice multi-set of T bubbles, then I will look at the union of their common neighbors. So that's the same picture I had here. I look at the common neighbors of this bubble and of this bubble, and I draw the union. But I look in one specific block, and actually I look only in the bit that's not covered by the bubbles. And I want that that union of common neighbors is always significantly larger than T. So it's expanded by a log factor. Okay, so this is the property that I want the random block model to have. And I claim if it has this property, then I will actually be able to embed any N vertex D degenerate graph. So I think what I would do is I would say very briefly, where this might come from, and then talk about how to do the embedding, because this is a very pretty algorithm, and then not try and justify the probabilistic calculations for why we get this. Okay, so <clears throat> the claim I'm making, and this is where the union bound comes in again, is this probabilistic statement is going to be enough. Okay, so the picture here is I have one block WK, and I have a collection of bubbles all over my block model. Some of them intersect WK and some of them don't. And the probabilistic statement is like this. If I fix one particular vertex, which is in WK and not in the collection of bubbles, and I call it U, then the chance that for some bubble this happens, that U is in the common neighborhood of the bubble, should be at least this quantity. Okay, so at the moment I'm just going to claim this is a probabilistic statement that you can deduce from what I've told you about the random block. Um, 
Suppose we know this statement is true. Well, in that case, we can calculate the expected number of vertices in this set, which should be in the union of these common neighborhoods. Okay, we just multiply this probability by the size of the block. And remember that not too many things in the block got covered by the bubbles. And what we will get is this cancels with this. Okay, actually, it sort of does a little bit more than cancel, and you get something at least t times a poly log n. Okay, the chance that you then don't have this many neighbors is going to be exponentially small in t poly log n by the Chernoff bound. And if you now count how many sets of bubbles are there with exactly t bubbles, it's enough for the union bound to work. So this is a fairly small collection of things that we're trying to take a union bound over. Okay. So if we assume this probabilistic statement, then I'm claiming a sort of three-line calculation gives you this deterministic statement. Okay, so what I want to do for the next 10 minutes is explain, suppose we know that this deterministic statement is true, how am I going to embed a degenerate graph? Okay, so I've sort of said most of it already. We're going to embed in degeneracy order. We know which block we will look in to put in a degree of any given vertex. And there's only one more thing I need to say, which is how exactly we do that within a block. And this is some kind of very pretty idea of Reiko Nenadov. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is we look at a block and we will split it up into a bunch of sub blocks, okay, log n of them. Okay, so this is just a partition into this many disjoint subsets. Okay, so the way we choose our sizes is like this. The first block is going to be big. It's going to have half of the entire block. And the rest of the blocks are going to all have the same size, just equally split the rest of the block. Okay, so all of them are of size roughly 1 over 2 log n times the original block size. So here is the embedding algorithm. So <clears throat> we, have a, we get given a graph G. We're going to embed its vertices, as I said, in degeneracy order. We come to our vertex number T. And the way we pick where to embed it is we look in a particular subblock. So we look in WKJ, where K is chosen like this. So this is what I said before. We look at the vertex T, we look at its degree, and we choose K so that the degree is in this interval. Okay, so this is the thing that's just saying a vertex whose degree in G is large will go to an early block. If it's small, it will go to a later block. And we still need to say how to choose J. And we actually do sort of something that looks quite simple. We just choose the first J so that we can do the embedding. Okay, so the picture we have here is here is our WK. This is the first subblock WK1. And then there are all of the rest of the subblocks. And when we look at our graph G, we have, this is a terrible picture, we have a bunch of vertices which are neighbors of T that come before T. Okay, so these are our back neighbors. These went to some bubble, which I'm going to draw disjointly from WK, although it doesn't have to be. Uh, we look at the common neighborhood which maybe looks something like this. And we will pick a vertex in this common neighborhood, which is in the first block that we can embed it to. So what, what might we not be able to embed to? Well, let's look at the image of our graph G. It can be that G's image covers lots of this first block and maybe even quite a bit of the second block. So we couldn't embed into the first or second sub block because the image of G that we've already embedded covers it. And in this example, there's left a vertex in here in this third sub block that we can embed to. So what we would do is embed there arbitrarily. Okay, so this is how we do the embedding. So I need to prove that this actually works. 
So how does the proof look? So I'm going to make a claim about how many vertices get embedded to each subblock. I'm going to write down a bunch of numbers. L is for limit. This is the maximum number. OK, so LK1, I'm going to define like this. OK, so for every block, I'm saying for this first big subblock, I'm going to claim we embed at most that many vertices of G into this first big subblock. OK, and after this, I just let this limit number decrease by a factor 4 log n for each further subblock. <clears throat> OK, so the claim here is this embedding algorithm, assuming this aim statement, this deterministic property that came on the previous slide holds, will never embed more than LKJ vertices to the subblock WKJ. OK, so this is what I'm claiming. And the way we're going to prove this is sort of in two cases. The easy case is for the first big subblock. OK, so what's the argument here? So the argument is just saying I look at my graph G. The number of vertices of degree delta k plus one or bigger is at most this many. Okay. Again, this is the same calculation we saw earlier. This is the biggest the degree some can possibly be. So we're just applying the hand shaking lemma. And the point is if I have a vertex of degree at least this then that vertex potentially could get put into block number K. If it has degree less than this, then it definitely will not get put into block number K. So this is saying at most this many vertices, which is going to come out to be basically this number. OK, I'm ignoring constants here, apparently. Uh, can possibly get put into the entire WK subblock. So clearly, most of this many could possibly get put into WK1. OK, so this part is just saying our choice of embedding according to degree is just not giving us enough vertices to violate this first bound. OK, so now what I want to do is I want to say, why is this second bound going to hold all the way through the algorithm? And OK, we use sort of the usual thing of saying, suppose we look at the first time that this is supposed to fail. OK, so we run this embedding algorithm and we say, let's look at the first time where this limit that we are claiming is exceeded. OK, and now the picture that we're supposed to have here is the following. So I have this block WK with its one big first subblock and its several smaller subblocks. And I'm imagining that this subblock has got overloaded. Right, so there are too many vertices that got put to this subblock. Okay, now what I will do is I will say each of these vertices came from a vertex of G. Okay. And each of these vertices of G has a set of back neighbors. Okay. And these sets of back neighbors define a collection of bubbles H. So if I look at the embedded back neighbors, these things define a collection of bubbles, which I will call curly B. OK. And there are LKJ of these bubbles B. OK. Now, the point here is what? So for each of these bubbles, if I look at the union, if I look at the neighborhood of this bubble, 
within this sub block here. Okay, so this is the J minus one sub block, so the immediately preceding sub block. Okay, what I can see is this sub block, the image of G must have completely filled this bu bubble. Okay, if the image of G does not completely fill this bubble, then by minimality, I wouldn't have embedded the vertex into LKJ into the WKJ subblock. I've embedded it into this one earlier one. Okay, so what that says is if I look at the union of these common neighborhoods within this subblock, they are entirely covered by the image of G. Okay, and this is a contradiction because this union of subblocks. OK, is going to be too big. It's going to be more than this LKJ minus 1, OK, because LKJ I divided only by 1 over 4 log n, and my expansion factor is more than 4 log n. OK, so this is a contradiction. So there cannot be a first failure. In other words, this claim holds all the way through. OK, and... Why this says the embedding completes is if I look at LK log N, so the limit for the last block, this number turns out to be actually smaller than one. Okay, and what that's saying is there will always, if nothing else, be a place we can embed to in this final subblock. Okay, um, so where this is then at is assuming this deterministic property that a collection of T bubbles always expands by a factor of at least 10 log N. Okay, then we can always embed any graph G. And the bit I haven't proved and given that I'm most of an hour in, I think I will not prove is how do we write down this probabilistic estimate? So I will sort of show the slide and say very little more about it. What we do is an application of the second moment method, and it's sort of not too hard a calculation, but a slightly unusual one. Okay, um, details are on the paper on archive. Okay, so as I'm about at the end of time, I think I should just get to open questions. So this is the actual bound we prove. So with all the log factors and even a log log factor. Uh, this is how many edges actually show up in this random block model, which we prove is universal. Um, and it would be very nice to know if we can do better. Okay, do we need these? Uh, or can we get away with just this polynomial bound? So actually, the bound that Conlon and Nenodov proved really is only better in that they can get rid of a log-log factor if you say, I don't want to have these high-degree vertices. Um, even improving this log factor would be kind of interesting. And it would be nice to know if this is actually the right answer. I have no very strong feeling if it is the right answer. I could well believe that there is a better argument than the counting argument I gave that says you need some kind of a log factor. On the other hand, I don't know what that argument should look like. Okay, and maybe this is the main question to answer. What actually should be the correct number of edges for universality? Uh, the other question, which I think I will say, because as Piotr mentioned, I'm a probabilist to some extent, uh, I would really like to know an answer to this question. What actually is the threshold P, such as just this vanilla random graph, is universal for graphs on n vertices with maximum degree delta. Okay, so I think this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.